Raising money for a startup is hard as hell, but a lot of founders make it harder on themselves by committing one of these common mistakes. What's up everyone? My name is JDM and I create videos here on YouTube to help first time founders find traction for their startup. And in my career, I've reviewed close to 2000 startup pitches now. And in this video, I'm gonna share the top 10 most common pitching mistakes that I see all the time. We're gonna start with the simple, straightforward ones and then move into the complex, maybe even surprising ones. I'm ready, let's do this, starting with number 10, breaking with convention. Now this might sound weird because everybody wants to be original. The problem is that pitches follow a pattern. So we all know that pitches are stories and stories have structure and structure creates predictability. And the problem with originality is that you get away from that predictability. The problem is that predictability is what allows the listener to take mental shortcuts when they're hearing a pitch. So when you break with that convention, you're increasing our cognitive burden. And ironically, your originality is actually causing us to hear and remember less of what you're saying, not more. Stick to around 10 slides. Guy Kawasaki calls this 10, 20, 30. 10 slides for a 20 minute pitch where no slide has any font smaller than 30 point. Follow this pattern and you'll have a much greater chance of getting your pitch to resonate. And now number nine, keeping us in suspense. This is actually a super common rookie mistake. Barely even saying their name, they launch into the problem, they build suspense and intrigue, and then they twist the knife, and then out of nowhere they go, and introducing our grand solution. The problem is that you're giving us all this information about the problem before we know why you're even telling us about the problem in the first place. In other words, we don't have context for what you're saying. So that when you finally do get to the solution, which is your startup, your product, we have to go back and recontextualize all of the information that you gave us about the problem. So instead of hearing your next three slides, we're back processing the problem and therefore we're hearing less. The first words out of your mouth that aren't your name should be what the hell you do. Not a tagline, not a slogan, not a clever phrase, but literally what you do. We call this an XY, as in we are the X for Y, the Uber for whatever, or we help X with Y, we help customer with problem. Help us out by giving us context from moment one. And now number eight, making shit up. I'm not talking about lying or other forms of dishonesty, though definitely don't do that. I'm talking about spewing bullshit to hand wave away things you don't have answers to. For example, when talking about your total addressable market, you might say, and if we only get 1% of this, bullshit. You might give a really silly TAM that's pointing to a really big market that you're not really pursuing. It's bullshit. If you're manufacturing something, you might not understand the unit economics and instead just give us the cost of materials. Bullshit. These are all just hand wavy and they don't communicate anything of value. In other words, they're just lazy. Don't include anything in your pitch that you can't defend. And now number seven, having no competition. Few things get you a faster no from an investor than saying that you don't have any competition. And that's for two reasons. The first is that you do have competition. And if you don't have any competition, then there's probably no there there. If no one, not even the customers trying to solve the problem that you're solving, you're probably not solving a problem worth solving. Even if you have no direct competitors, which by the way, isn't a good sign because the first company to market usually gets pretty bloody. But even if you have no direct competitors, the customer is doing something to try to solve the problem right now. So what are they doing? And there are lots of different ways to show competition. You can show it in a competitive matrix where you compare and contrast features. You could draw in one of those XY Cartesian grids where you get that corner in the upper left all to yourself. You could show how much money your customer is spending to try to solve this problem and more. But if you say that you don't have any competition, you're confessing that you don't understand your startup's space as well as you think you do. And now number six, no compelling opportunity. Come on, dude, you're pitching for capital. The whole point is to get really big. We're looking for what Alex Blumberg calls a credible theory of hugeness. In order for us to make any money off of it, you have to have the ability to get really huge. And you have to have a theory of how you're gonna get there and that theory has to be credible. But it starts with the hugeness, big opportunity. There are lots of ways to show that you have a really big opportunity. You could just have a really big TAM, a big market that you're trying to serve. You could be going after an underserved segment, a niche within a really big market. You could have data about a trend and show that your startup is poised to ride that wave as it increases. You could have data about a trend and show that your startup is well poised to ride the wave of success. 
But anyway, if you don't get the investor excited about the opportunity, they're just not going to care. Before we get on to step five, this channel is new, still fairly small, and I'm looking to grow it. So I have a little free offer for you. I coach founders looking to raise pre-seed, seed, or series A rounds of funding, and I've reviewed close to 2,000 pitches now, and I'll review yours for free. We'll hop on a video call, you'll give your pitch, I'll shred it with love, and then I will provide you some actionable next steps that you can use to make your pitch better. All I ask in return is that I can share that review here on YouTube. Win-win. I'm probably only gonna do one a week or so, so if that interests you, there's a link in the description that you can use to apply. Do it now. Okay, now back to our regularly scheduled programming with number five. No compelling go-to-market. Now this one is crazy common and it's a pet peeve of mine. Remember that credible theory of hugeness? Well, this is the theory part. You're gonna have to say how you get from nothing to something to huge. There are two common versions of this mistake that I see. The first is just assuming success, and that's gross. Startups are hard as hell. The second is confusing marketing strategy with go-to-market strategy. They're not the same thing. Again, it's nothing to something to huge, and marketing strategy can take you from something to huge, but it can't take you from nothing to something. Honestly, it'll just burn your runway. Instead, think in terms of 10x growth. Where's your first customer coming from, then the next 10, the next 100, the next 1,000, the next 10,000. It's a completely different approach depending on where you are in that progression, but think small and think how you're gonna take those next few steps. Don't assume that you're already huge and can do normal marketing. Wherever you are in that process, how are you gonna tackle that market? And don't hand wave, it drives us crazy. Okay, now moving on to number four, having a poorly defined customer. And forget pitching, not understanding your customer will kill your startup anyway. Founders often confuse having a large market with having a really broad, general customer. And those are not the same thing. We're looking for a tight niche within a large market that we can grow into. How specific should your niche be? Well, if you're anything before Series A, a lot more specific than you think. You wanna get so specific with your niche that it makes you uncomfortable, like you're just leaving too much on the table and you start going, ugh. And once you're at that level of specific, get one more click more specific. It's way more specific than you think. And now number three, having an unclear value proposition. This is related and it's actually pretty straightforward. If you can't articulate why people should buy your solution, people aren't going to buy your solution. This commonly happens when a startup's early sales come from a founder's one-on-one -on -one conversations with customers. But as you move from a founder-only sales process to a founder-led or even founder-less sales process, a much more specific definition of your value proposition is necessary just to convey the information, not to mention to scale. This also happens when you're serving too many different customers at once because all of the value propositions are actually different. You should be able to get crazy specific about the problem you're solving for your customer, the result that that gets them, and why the problem is urgent and severe enough that they will pay you to solve it. And now number two, having no traction. And oh boy, is this a big one and is it super common. Remember back again to that credible theory of hugeness. We talked about hugeness, we talked about the theory, this is the credible part. We want evidence from the market that you're on the right track, that there's a there there. We're looking for evidence of buying behavior from customers that says that this is something worth pursuing. There are lots of examples of what traction looks like. It could be early conversations with customers. It could be pre-sales. It could be letters of intent. It could be actual sales. And where you are in your startup life cycle is gonna say how much traction you should have and what that traction should look like. But the general rule is that the further along the evidence of buying behavior is, and the more of it you have, the more compelling your traction story is. In other words, having a thousand sales, it's much better than having a thousand interviews. And having a thousand sales is obviously better than having 10 sales. Another thing to keep in mind is that no one funds ideas. I mentioned before that I've heard close to 2,000 startup pitches, and I know angel investors who've heard way more than that. Trust me, we've heard your idea before. Now go out and do something with it and come back, and that's what gets an investor interested. And now the number one pitching mistake is asking for too much too soon. And this comes in two forms. The first is literally asking for more money than the evidence warrants. Investments are bets and we should always proportion our bets to the evidence. So if you want more money, you need to come with more evidence, a stronger team, more traction, better financials, etc. The second related way that this shows up is thinking you're fundable when you're not. Nine out of 10 startup pitches that I hear are from startups that are just not fundable yet. They just don't have enough evidence yet. 
And more than that, they don't actually need the investment in order to make progress. And asking for investment in lieu of making that progress just demonstrates your lack of imagination, your lack of creativity, and your lack of guile. And nobody wants to put money into a founder like that. The very first time that I pitched for capital, I was trying to raise 750,000 for a seed round. And this very nice, sage angel investor asked me a question during Q&A. He said, what are you going to do if you don't raise the round? And I didn't have a very good answer. But he was pointing at something that I was too inexperienced to see. He was pointing at the road not taken. He was pointing at a path to evidence without actually getting the investment. He was pointing to the evidence that I could get without raising a round, but I didn't see it. So I didn't get the funding and the startup folded. Lesson learned. Instead of focusing from day one on trying to get funded by investors, focus on trying to get funded by customers. And when it comes time to raise a round, ask for the appropriate amount. And now it's time for a bonus. If you think about all of these mistakes, a pattern actually emerges. You actually make most of these pitching mistakes before you actually pitch, before you even get in the room, before you send the investors your deck, and even before you even make the deck. Do you have an unclear value proposition? You probably haven't talked to enough customers yet. No competition? You probably haven't done enough competitive research yet. No traction? Well, you've got no traction yet. My advice, don't blow an opportunity by being unprepared. Look for the signal that you have more work to do. For example, if you're working on your deck and you can't figure out what exactly to put on your business model slide, the signal might be that you don't understand your business model well enough yet. You probably need to spend more time figuring out what your business model is. Because let me tell you a secret, you're probably not fundable yet anyway. If you wanna dive deeper into one of these topics, then maybe you should check out this video over here. And now it's your turn. What is the biggest challenge that you're having crafting your pitch right now? Drop it down in the comments and let me know. And that's it, thanks for watching. Have a fantastic rest of your day. Peace.